Value is tackled in a very fascinating way in the sixth layer of Maiden Abyss. The embodiment of that principle, Foputa, my favorite character in the series, highlights the accumulation of the themes that have been set up since the very beginning of this arc in chapter 39 as we move into the final few chapters of Ale Blue. This video will contain spoilers for Maiden Abyss up to the latest chapter released, which at this point of time is chapter 58. Now, let's begin. All of the backbone of this chapter can be boiled down to two pages from chapter 51.5, where Gabarun explains value to Faputa using her mother's words. She, the initial value. Ku, accumulating value. Getsu, the crystallization of value. My, extraordinary value. And the final Haku, the very highest value. This discussion will mainly center around Faputa and her progression through the stages of the value system established, but this accumulation can easily be extrapolated to any and all characters within the arc, even as minor as Ma or Kaja. The Beginning of Desire or a Modest Wish Our first exposure to the symbol comes from when Faputa stole Prushka from Riko and left Riko's drawing behind with Haku on Riko and she on Nanachi. Foputa recognizes the relationship between the trio immediately based on the proximity that the individual is drawn with respect to Reg, as the Haku that Reg was trying to find seems to be Riko herself. This is the beginning of that desire. Foputa is inquiring if Reg has in fact found his treasure so that he can finally fulfill Foputa's own wish. It's also important to note that Foputa used hair to stuff these animals, as for her, this is the lowest level of value that someone, a living being, can possess, especially once they enter into the village itself. When an unknown reg returns back to her, one that she recognizes as her property but his desires are changed, she's confused. Is her wish still a part of reg's goals? Faputa holds on to the only remaining thing that she knows of him, the goggles that he gave her last time reg was in this lair. But even still, Faputa's wish stays the same as she wants to seek revenge for her mother no matter the cost and is willing to trust this unknown reg in hopes that her wish will be granted. We also know that Faputa cares about nurturing of wishes in general because of how she caters to those that long for something more in their lives. Gabaroon wished to be repaired and without knowing any language at the time, Faputa was willing to find parts for this machine, who later became the queen's guardian. Reg wished to get to the fifth layer to find his Haku, and Faputa led the way to safe passage to send him on his journey. Prushka in her initial white whistle form isn't the final stage of her desire, unlike the Narahate in the village. While Faputa's mother was the one that molded these souls into the shape that they are as Narahate now, but Faputa makes sure that the white whistle ends up with Proilun, the jeweler, to bring out its true form. Fubuta at this stage has yet to learn the true form of her own wish. All that she carries is the anger towards the residents of the village, the embers of regret and hatred from her mother. The Piling of Value or Beyond Desire Wazukun's final Speech is actually the perfect embodiment of this stage of value, that every action or inaction is an accumulation of signals over time that cascade down to the final result. A curiosity will prevail through the next leg of the journey into the unknown, into layer 7. Bailoff's will was inherited by Nanachi, Wazukun's will inherited by Riko, Leza's will inherited by Reg, Veiko's slash Irimu's will inherited by Faputa as all the things that you collect those memories, those smells, and those desires carry on with those who move forward. And this is that accumulation. This also ties into the overall cyclical theme of the story as it seems like big events happen every 2000 years. And as we're approaching the tail end of this current cycle, so does that accumulation that has been built up and is ready to overflow. Even looking at it in the small scale, the whole Genja Suicide Squad flashback was the accumulation of the village's story that was thrown into Faputa's origin. After so much time has passed, Faputa herself shows hints of refining that dream into something that she can call her own. The solidification of a wish of purity. Although the Gatsu for Irimu is Faputa, Faputa's own Gatsu didn't exist until the village barrier broke. This is where the distinction between an imposed will and a self-actualized will happens. 
The dichotomy between revenge and what she feels when her prey is hunted by another predator is when we see the core of what her real desire is. Why is Faputa the thing that is most desired but also feared? Why does Faputa have this feeling of rage and pain and anguish that apparently her mother left her? I don't believe that Irimu actually holds any of that sorrow towards the others in the Ganja squad. It isn't their fault that her children died within her arms and it isn't their fault that the harsh environment exists in the sixth layer. It could be that Veiko's projected pain of being indecisive and the guilt of not being able to do anything for her friend, for someone that views Veiko as a mother, is given to Fabuta in essence. Seeing both the joy of having the ability to give birth but also that same happiness stripped away into sorrow is the origin that of the hatred that Faputa holds. Faputa receives these foreign memories from Bailoff of happy times because it's the only thing, it's the one thing that Irme didn't take away when giving Bailoff their new form, showing that Irme wanted to instill joy for her surviving daughter. The liberation of a wish of purity and impurity and of chaos. These unknown memories challenge Faputa's reason for existence that tell her to be happy and that tell her to go on to an adventure, invade that sole purpose that she's been desiring for this entire time, that she's been desiring, accumulating, and solidifying a very core part of her being and that's being shaken up. A lot of the characters in this arc also go through this kind of switch up when the truth becomes clear to them. Veiko gets the resolve to die with Irime and wants to become one with her so that they can be at peace together. Bailoff is ready to toss aside the last true memory that she holds dear for the sake of Faputa's future. Wazukun, who was willing to let the value of the village increase for entertainment and for fun earlier, used up his precious Narhate body to keep that same village intact just a little bit longer, forsaking his future journey. Nanachi had to put Miti out of her misery yet again, but now has even more resolve to do it once more if a similar situation arises. These characters reveal their innate wish and goal and act accordingly to that. Even with all these unknowns to Faputa, an unknown reg, unknown memory, unknown Gabu, an unknown mother, she is Faputa, the Narhate princess at heart. All the memories that she got mad at Reg for losing is turned on her at the end of this arc when she finds her own memories that were lost to her. Just like Irime gained temporary bliss to have children, Faputa finds that similar shift in her hatred. The things whose eyes she couldn't tolerate are now filled with fondness and kindness. This is what diverges her towards her new true dream. The manifestation of that wish or shape of the soul. Faputa's siblings become one with her, causing her hair to grow longer. A thing that she thought had little value in others like Riko and Nanachi now has the strength to give her to keep fighting. But fighting for what? Although she sees these pitiful creatures that use her mother and acknowledges being disgusted by them, she is something that embodies value, and just like the beginning of her story, she gives value to those that need it, accepting parts of the Narhate, claiming the balancing to wrong those who wrong her, and even taking the thing that causes Veiko pain, and using it to defend those that her mother cherishes. That inherited will lives on deep in Fabuta as she finds and searches for her new purpose. Her immortality that she felt was useless and just burdensome, couldn't do anything before, now shows its true colors to give strength when needed. And as we move into the next layer in a few chapters, I most certainly hope that Faputa joins the crew on their journeys and their adventures and she refines her new desire fully. That is all for the video. This was originally intended for me to formulate why I was so perplexed by Faputa as a character and what she really means to me. And it was a lot of fun to finally reread this arc as I am usually completely confused every time I read a new chapter of Made in Abyss ever since I got caught up, I believe chapter 54 or 55. Also, I apologize for any and all mispronunciations because uh, I suck at it, so uh, it is what it is. These character names are a little challenging to me. But yeah, Fuputa, her immortality, her revenge, and her progression is just beautifully done. And I'm excited to see what else we have left in store. Since these chapters are highly infrequent, I will try to cover the series as new ones drop, so like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.